Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the NFL Draft Triple Take presented by UPMC. Mike Pursuta, along with Matt Williamson and Dale Lawley, we have been getting you up to speed on the upcoming NFL Draft position by position. Today, we're going to take a good long look at cornerback, but uh, before we do that, it's uh, my job to remind you that uh, all of these videos are going to be shared on Steelers.com, the Steelers mobile app, and the Steelers official YouTube page. The audio can also be heard on the Triple Take podcast and on Steelers Nation Radio. In, uh, in the event you're interested in subscribing to the Triple Take podcast, you can do that wherever you download your favorite on-demand audio content. Guys, our, our first run through this has been uh, interesting, enlightening, and Dale, I wanted to start with you today. And I was curious, when I looked at these cornerbacks, I kept looking, thinking, boy, that guy can play. That guy can play. That guy can play. Like, like we <laughs> talked about with wide receivers and maybe a little bit with the new age, you know, hybrid inside linebacker. The passing game is forcing the evolution of people that are involved in that. And I think the corner position is keeping up. Yeah, I think this is this is something uh, that, that has happened. You know, if you have all these great wide receivers uh, coming out of college football, you better have guys that can cover them. And so I think you're seeing some some guys, uh, you know, w with ball skills starting to move over there. Guys who, who are bigger, who can run. You're not seeing as – I mean, you look down this list uh, of guys here, and it's not that hard to find a six foot, six one, six even six two or bigger cornerback who can run in this year's draft. And you know that that's something that's certainly needed. I, I did make note. I, I went back and looked at the 2015 through 2017 draft. So three years of, of drafts there that those guys are now heading into their second contracts. There were 14 cornerbacks taken in the first rounds of, of those three drafts, Mike. And only 11 of those guys are still with their original team. I think you're just renting cornerbacks in today's NFL because they're just so expensive to keep. Matt, is it just that, or is that a position that's a little tricker, trickier to evaluate? You know, I was watching some of these guys coming up and laying the wood on the uh, the short out routes and things of that nature, and I'm thinking, well, that's impressive. He knocked that guy backwards, but then again, that guy ain't DK Metcalf. <laughs> right, or a tight end, or, yeah, right. Um it is interesting that there's been that much turnover with these first round corners. And I think a lot of it, and we really saw it with this past rookie class, the highly drafted corners really struggled this, this past year as rookies. That's a trend with this position, a lot like tight ends. It takes them a year or two. And of course, if you're a rookie corner out there, you've got a bullseye on your chest. I mean, you're going to have to prove yourself the hard way. Um, but to Dale's point too, this class is interesting. I mean, there is a lot of, size speed guys and this is the last of our first round triple takes you but mean it's more than just one that seattle? We, somebody else that? more than just seattle can have a, a big tall long cornerback so <laughs> exactly somebody else can get in on that but we actually have some pro days to go off of with this group a little bit too and the tape matches up with some of the 40s and you know numbers we're seeing for this crop let's uh let's dive into it matt we'll uh we'll keep it with you to, to kick things off here who's who's number five in your top five yeah, I thought there was a pretty clear top four, and I thought there was a lot of cases for different number fives. I went with a bit of a projection. Tyson Campbell from Georgia, over 6'1", long, lean, um, very quick and agile. You know, had a good pro day as well, but, you know, I, I, I would have put him there before knowing those numbers. Not great ball production. You hope his best football is ahead of him. Dale, uh, to Matt's point about uh... – four pretty clear and then take your choice you, you've got a different yeah. number five I, I went with the same school uh, I went with uh, with his teammate uh, Eric Stokes uh, ran a sub 4 three forty at, at his uh, pro day uh, has a, a ton of speed again another one of these long lean cornerbacks six one 185 um, you know I think you could hear any number I, I don't know that we're going to see necessarily uh, you know five or six cornerbacks taken in the first round this year but I think by the end of the second uh, second round, you could see as many as 10 uh, because there's that many guys there that it just depends on what you're looking for. And, and certainly by the end of round three, you're going to be looking at, at uh, you know, 15, maybe even more. Uh, but uh, Stokes is a guy that, uh, you know, kind of piqued my interest. Uh, Georgia has a, several cornerbacks in this year's draft. Uh, you know, it's it just uh, but I, I thought Stokes with that speed is going to be intriguing to somebody. Yeah, I went uh, outside the box a little bit as well with my number five. Now, 
This guy's not from Alabama, but he started in Alabama and then he transferred. So to me, that's good enough. He's an Alabama guy, even though he's actually a Central Florida guy. Aaron Robinson, who's not the biggest or the heaviest, but uh, he is very versatile. Uh, Todd McShay of ESPN has compared him to Minka Fitzpatrick. Um, you know, that could be wrong, but what if it's right? Uh, that's <laughs> a pretty good guy to be compared to, uh, like his game. And a uh, little history. I don't know if you guys knew I was a dual major in college, history major, as well as uh, journalism. And uh, Aaron Robinson comes from the ha- same high school as Jerry Judy, another Alabama guy, and Jason Pierre Paul. So uh, he bad. knows how to get there or get here from there, I should say. Uh, Dale, <laughs> we'll double back and. Uh, Take a look at your number four. Yeah, I have Robinson actually at number four. Um, you know, I think, as you mentioned, he has versatility. You can play him in the slot. Uh, he has the size to play outside. He has got quick feet uh, and plays with good physicality in the run game as well. I, I think there's a lot to like there with this guy. And, you know, I, I think uh, that, you know, not, uh, you know, not things not working out <laughs> at Alabama and forcing you to transfer that is, that's not necessarily a bad thing because we're going to talk about another guy here soon, uh, you know, who maybe forced some guys to transfer out of Alabama. Matt, what do you got? I went with Greg Newsom, Northwestern. Um, I really like this guy a lot. Uh, he's really long. I think he's very smooth, but he's also quite sudden. Uh, smart dude, Northwestern, that adds up. Um, has a, a confidence, a swagger about him. Um, time and tested pretty well, real well at Northwestern Pro Day. But he only played three games in 2020. So, as is the case with a lot of these draft prospects this year, there's a little bit of a leap of faith there. Yeah, you know, I got to tell you, it's always kind of irked me. Every time you talk about a guy from Stanford or Northwestern, he's got to be a smart guy, right? You just got to <laughs> be like, you never hear him say, boy, this guy went to Michigan State. He's really got a lot on the ball. Why, well, why you that? know, we know some people from Michigan State, and, you know, <laughs> history tells us. But that yeah. is not necessarily the case. Earn your <laughs> reputation. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, my number four is uh, Asante Samuel. Smart guy out of Florida State. A lot of smart guys coming out of Florida State. He's another one. Uh, again, not the biggest 5'10", a buck 84. But uh, Asante Samuel allows me to introduce what is a running theme with this year's quarterback crop. And that is uh, bloodlines, NFL ties, uh, you know, relatives, uh, in the fathers who have done this. Awesome. And, I, you know, that's not a guarantee, but to me, it is a profound advantage. Uh, it's such a difficult transition, even for the best players from college football to the, to the NFL. If you've got a guy who knows the ropes and can teach you a little something about how to train or nutrition or practice habits or how to break down film or recovery, it's got to help, right? Got to. Yeah, especially at that position, Mike. I mean, when you're going to get – you are going to be beaten at the NFL level. Maybe you're not necessarily used to that. Maybe it didn't happen a lot in college. Well, dad can pull you aside and say, hey kid, uh, that's gonna happen to you. You know, your so, old man got beat, you know, right? Yeah, your old man got beat. <laughs> or, or in the case of, uh, I think my next guy here, JC Horn at number three, uh, dad beat a lot of guys in the NFL. Yeah, I got I got him at number three too, but why don't you uh, take the ball and run with him? Yeah, a bit, you know, he's, he's uh, the son of Joe Horn, who of course was a long time wide receiver. Started out at, at the slot at South Carolina, in the slot at South Carolina early in his career. Has moved outside the last uh, two years. By the uh, way, when he brags about his son, is Joe? Is he blowing his own horn? I believe he hey. is. He's tooting it a little bit there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, with, with Horn, uh, I, I I didn't see him tested a whole lot this past year uh, by by many guys, and he would lock down. You know, if you if you could avoid that guy, you avoid that guy. But he did have a pair of interceptions. Uh, you know, he's he's very physical with wide receivers. Uh, we'll see if they, you know he's able to, to convert that into the NFL. But he's a nice prospect here. Uh, you know, some teams he, he may be moving up a little bit here because you know the guy that I have at number one might be slipping a little bit. Matt, yeah, what are you on uh, Horn at number three? What uh, what struck you about him? Yeah, a lot of the same things, and just to kind of reiterate some things that Dale said, more so than some of these other top guys. A lot of these guys played left or right. He would follow the top guy around a lot, and people still kind of avoided him. Really good at the catch point. The thing that that really jumps out at me more than these other guys is his physicality and aggressiveness. I mean, that's both, you know, as a tackler, through routes, just the way he plays the game. 
but that, that's also a little bit of a red flag. I mean, if you're that grabby and physical, you're going to draw a lot more flags at the NFL level. He's got to kind of tone it down a little, but he brings some nastiness to the field. That's kind of industry wide, right? I mean, for, for the most part, college corners have to be taught not to be as grabby. Sure. As they, were able they get, to get away, away with it more at the college level. You know, yeah. they can, they can do more of that. So, you know, I think again, it goes back to some of the struggles that those rookie cornerbacks have in the NFL, because it is the transition. Uh, you know, you, you just can't touch the NFL receivers. You'd think it would go the other way around. You would think that the college rules would be a little tighter with that. And at the NFL level, they would, you know, loosen up a little bit. It's the exact opposite. I want to give guys one more uh, box that horn checked, at least for me. Uh, watching a lot of his highlights, and I kept noticing him playing against Alabama, which I don't know if you guys are aware, Alabama's putting a lot of guys into the NFL, uh, you know, in the Nick Saban, his King era. And I, I've seen uh, I've seen J.C. Horn tackle Najee Harris. I've seen him come up and knock the ball out of Devontae Smith's hands, and I've seen him run with Jerry Judy. So uh, that's three NFL guys. He was doing it at South Carolina. I think he could transfer it to Sundays. My number two. Huh? What conference did they play in? Alabama? Yeah. <laughs> I believe that was South, the uh, SEC. South Carolina. I believe that was the SEC as well. I believe so, yeah. <laughs> uh, Virginia Tech is where my uh, number two guy's from. Uh, Caleb Farley. And this is the guy I was referencing, Matt, when I was asking you about hitting ability and does the transfer. I mean, he was knocking people back. He doesn't tackle you. He knocks you. If it's third down, he knocks you back to second down. You get to try it again. Um, the way this guy runs with receivers, he knows how to use the body position and kind of the basketball, uh, you know, hip control type of deal. But he's also very aggressive when the ball gets there. He knows how to fight for the football. Uh, this guy was really fun to watch. Um, I had a hard time not picking him number one, but I found a way. Um, Matt, you also have uh, Caleb Farley as number two. Dale is the dissenter here. Yeah, and was torn between the top two without question. And as Dale mentioned, a little bit of news came out since we turned these in, is he had a back procedure or surgery. I'm not exactly sure how you describe it. I'm not a doctor, but it sounds like it's a four-month recovery period. Supposed this to be isn't no so pro bad. day, but back by training camp, right? Right. But he opted out last year, too. So the opt-out is why I put him at two. You throw this back thing in there, maybe he falls a little. That's a hard thing to speculate on, but you're right. His traits are off the charts. I mean, he is really fast. He's really tall and long, and he knows how to use those traits really well, too. Yeah, I mean, he had, in 2019, it's the last time we saw him on the field, uh, 16 pass defenses and four interceptions. I mean, he is super active at, with the football. Uh, as Mike mentioned, he's a very willing tackler. Uh, again, I had him at number one. That was before the news came out about the, uh, the back surgery. I think maybe he gets pushed down a little bit. And maybe even behind J.C. Horn now, uh, because some teams, this could be a Heath Miller type situation. You know, you didn't get to see him play this year. You're not going to get to see him work out, so you won't know exactly how fast he is. But again, you turn on the tape and you see him running with everybody. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a leap of faith uh, a bit here. Uh, you know, does the back check out? You know, you're going to have to uh, like the medicals. And, you know, you're going to have to, uh, uh, you know, take that leap of faith that that you know he's going to be okay you know i i don't often see guys who you mentioned the fluidity and how he can run with people you, you don't see a lot of guys that can run like he does and hit like he does and and even his interceptions he tracks the ball like it was meant for him you know i, I, I hate to give this comparison mike but there was a little bit I, I, watching him was a little bit like watching rod woodson there's there's some of that you know, you know that's, I didn't think of it at the time, but that's not that's not totally you know, out of uh, the ball skills are there, the field. physicality is there, the ability to, to run with guys is there, the size is there. Uh, there's a lot to like there with Caleb Farley. That's why I had him at number one. But again, that, that medical stuff is going to have to test out. Yeah, your number two, uh, at least when you initially uh, presented this, uh, is the number one according to Matt and I. Uh, Patrick Sertain the second. Dale, what conference is he playing? <laughs> uh, he would be in the SEC, Mike. And he was a freshman starter in the SEC at Alabama. I doesn't mean, that, 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 that just doesn't happen at that position. Uh, you know, so, I mean, obviously, but, you know, he's he's another one of these. Uh, Patrick, he's, he's the second, uh, of course, because his dad came first and his dad was a longtime NFL cornerback. Very good uh, one. Yeah, and a very good one. So, 
you know, everything that you that you you want you want to see with a cornerback, this guy does. Uh, his pro day was good. He, he, you know, some people thought, well, maybe he won't run super well. Well, he ran in the, you know, uh, four fours, which is plenty fast enough. Um, you know, if I had a body like that, like he does, I would never wear a shirt either. Uh, he was shirtless at his pro day. Um, you know, there's just a lot here to like. Should be a very solid player at the NFL level. Yeah, there, there's a lot to like, and I think he learned a lot from dad. He's obviously very gifted with size. I was a little concerned about his speed watching the tape, um, but he did run extremely well at his pro day. He's physical. He's what really stood out to me, I guess, more than anything, though, was he never panics. He he's always plays the game in balance. He's under control. Why would you ever patient. panic if you're playing for Alabama, though? Well, I mean, hey, we got those, this. Um, <laughs> you know. I mean he's, he always looks like he's under control and has a real good feel for it. I mean, patience is something that corners need to have, and he has it really well and has played a lot of man coverage in his life, too. Yeah, I, I got very little to add. Uh, you guys did a real comprehensive job uh, there. I just would say, you know, going into an NFL draft, if you're an NFL team, and, hey, if you're not an NFL team, why are you going into an NFL draft? If you need something, go to the Alabama store. Good store. Doesn't, doesn't it's, much matter what. Uh, maybe not sleepers. The Tide uh, don't produce a lot of sleepers. Uh, you, get uh, some Matt, you, those? you got one of those for us? Yeah, I, I went to Oklahoma, though, for mine. Uh, I got Trey Brown. He's not one of these big, tall, lean corners. Uh, he's 5'10", 185 pounds. Uh, but, man, is he feisty, and he ran a, a 4 4 40 at Oklahoma's Pro Day. Um, over the past two years, uh, 98 tackles. 24 pass breakups, an interception, two sacks. Um, there, there's, a, there's a little bit of Mike Hilton there. Uh, you know, a guy like that that, uh, you know, can step right into the slot. But this guy also has the ability to step outside and, and, and match up on the outside, even though he's 5'10", 185 pounds. Uh, he, can do, he can do a lot for you uh, as a mid-round guy. Yeah, I, went with, I, I went with Robert Rochelle. It's a real small school, Central Arkansas. If they do a play about him, would it be called Rochelle Rochelle? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you'll see many of these real small school guys opting out, but he did this year after a five interception season the year before. I bet nobody would have thrown at him this year anyway if he would have dressed because he's probably the best guy in the field every time he goes out there. Good frame, just under six feet, long, tested incredibly well. I mean, over an 11 foot long jump, 43 inch vertical, low four fours. Ball production. I wonder if he's going to go a lot higher than people might guess. And uh, I'll give you guys a hint. Uh, I don't know if you can see the magnet over my shoulder. Go well, Michigan State there. I'm going uh, Shakur Brown from uh, Michigan State University. That's in the Big Ten, Dale. And uh, you guys might be skeptical since you know I'm a Michigan State grad. Oh, tremendous Super. smart guy. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank, thank you yeah. for pointing that out. Uh, <laughs> but in addition to that, here is uh, – the assessment of the great Daniel Jeremiah of, of the NFL Network, who has become the new Mike Mayock, the uh, the guru of draft. Here's what he had to say about Shakur Brown. Quote, day one nickel. I love what he does against the run. You watch the tape, and then you watch a cut-up of his ball production. He's got some crazy interceptions, man. Really phenomenal ball skills. I think he's kind of a fourth-round type nickel. And uh, I would concur. Well, there you go. I mean, if, if, if the Michigan State guy likes the Michigan State guy, <laughs> who are we to argue? <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good place to wrap up corner. I do want to remind everybody uh, that's finding us, we're going to continue updating our position-by-position position assessments uh, in the days leading up to the draft. We're just getting started. here. We've, got, we've gone around the horn once, and now we're going to be doubling back and uh, you know, kind of reconfiguring and rethinking and probably overthinking. Uh, truth be told, we might uh, analyze ourselves right into a rabbit hole, but uh, that's what we're here for. So uh, keep finding us wherever and however you found us uh, leading right up to the NFL draft. Just want to remind you before we get out of here, uh, all these uh, videos are going to be on Steelers.com, the Steelers mobile app, and the official Steelers YouTube page. Uh, you can catch the audio on the Triple Take podcast and Steelers Nation Radio, and you can subscribe to the Triple Take podcast wherever you download your favorite on-demand audio content. That's it for round one, but stay tuned because more is coming. For Dale Lawley and Matt Williamson, I'm Mike Pursuta. You've been listening to the NFL Draft Triple Take presented by UPMC.